Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Friday uh, Informatics Power Talk series. Um, actually, sorry to put you on the spot, John. Do you want to introduce Dr. Gao since you, you know sure. her? Sure. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Thank you for that. <laughs> um, a little bit of a surprise, but I think I can probably uh, stumble through an introduction. Uh, so I met uh, Yanjun Gao in person uh, last year at AMIA, but um, I regularly meet with uh, Yanjun Gao on <clears throat> a methods call that uh, Gregana Savova uh, at Harvard University runs, and uh, we have weekly chats. Uh, she did her PhD, I believe, at the University of uh, Pennsylvania in um, NLP, uh, and now she is working at the, uh, I think it's the ICU Data Science Lab um, with uh, Majid uh, Ashbar, who also spoke at UAB. Um, not too long ago, uh, and does a lot of work with large language models, uh, but applied to uh, medicine uh, and clinical practice, which is why I'm so excited to have her today. Uh, so I guess without further ado, Yan Jun Gao, go ahead and Dr. Yan Jun Gao, go ahead and and start your presentation. Yeah, thank you, John, for the introduction. But I I do want to uh, make one clarification. I graduated from Pennsylvania State University, not UPenn. <laughs> Although oh. I wish I could graduate from UPenn. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, the better yeah. pen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, my talk today will be focusing on augmented AI, uh, augmented intelligence for healthcare. How can LMs help physicians at the best size? So you can see the focus of today would be on the LLMs. But of course, like there are many things going on right now besides LLM. But I think, like, definitely, like, this topic uh, will be fit to most of people's interest in this audience. So let me start my talk by um, showing you this uh, electronic health record interface screenshot. So when the patient is sent to the hospital, like they would be uh, putting under through multiple rounds of screenings and each round of screening would generate new documents in the EHR. You can see that given this like fake patient, this is a fake data showing here, and this is a um, EHR interface from the Epic system, which is located in uh, Wisconsin, Verona. Um, and then it has multiple days of visits, uh, uh, days of visits, and also been through like different specialties of care teams. For example, like there are uh, neurosurgery, like their wound, um, and then there are different node types associated with it, like progress node, like consult node, like HMP, like um, history uh, or past records. Um, and then on the right side of the screen, you can see that under the past medical history, there are like objective data, for example, like the structure data, the tabular data. There are also like the nature of tags, uh, the nature of language um, saying like, this is a 60 year old female uh, with test presenting with test um, and what's the possible conditions for this patient. So um, as the patient situation getting worse and worse, there would be many, many documents that generated along this process, especially in like critical care unit ICU, which is where um, my uh, the lab that I'm working on sitting inside. Like the patient's situation would get updated every hour and every hour there are new data that have been generated. So you can imagine at the end of the day, there are tons of data that accumulated inside this EHR. While the EHR was originally designed to help optimize the workflow for the clinical practice, but they actually bring in more problems than it's supposed to be. So one of the paper from Lancet Respiratory Medicine in 2020 was talking about, uh, they did an interview to uh, uh, multiple groups of clinicians and they asked them about how they feel about um, using EHR. So one of the sentences that I highlight here, which I think will be a good beginning of my talk is, what is the most important information and where to find them in the EHR? In other words, like while EHR has more, like rich information, rich representation for a patient's problems, it also causes this information overflow, uh, overload and causing the clinicians feeling burnout and don't know where to find the most important information. Um, and the most, the worst consequence from that might be medical errors, such as diagnostic errors, medication errors, you can imagine such and such. So I'm just putting figure here from the um, AHR key to, to show that EHR is actually one of the major cause from, uh, for the clinical, uh, clinician's burnout. 
And nowadays, since we've been entering this new era of uh, large language models, so I'm putting here like a landscape of language models right now, many of them that, that you might be really familiar with, for example, like the Meta, like ChatGPT, uh, or other models from Parking Face. And then there's all, also some like new startup, like Anthropic, um, um, Cohere, like these are all the like rising startups that focusing on large language models. Uh, we know that currently like large language model can do fabulous jobs in terms of understanding the text, generating flu and text. Well, we have this progress in the large language model. We also have been making progress in applying NLP to EHR data. And one of the obstacles that we've been having in the field is how we can share data or share EHR to encourage the collaborations inside the field. So I wanna put up one of the, um, the most famous public EHR data set here, which is Mimic. Um, because of Mimic, like it stimulates or facilitates mo uh, many of the collaborations in this field from computer science, informatics, um, clinicians to sit together, work on many like clinical issues um, that can be solved by using uh, or better technology on analyzing EHR data. And uh, the, as well as the, the clinical, public clinical, uh, available clinical NLP tasks, for example, N2C2 is one of them that started from like 2000, uh, I think it was 2005, the first N2C2 task um, that encouraged like people from different community to sit together and work on these clinical NLP problems. So we did a scoping review on um, the past like existing um, publicly available clinical NLP task because we are trying to figure, well, what is the state of the clinical NLP task now on? What have been people focusing on? So we are looking at is the count of the clinical applications from, I think it was like almost 30 clinical uh, shared tasks or NLP shared tasks, uh, meaning they provide a publicly available data sets that they uh, call for participations um, and provide support for the entire community to solve the problems. Um, and you can see that besides a long list of these clinical tasks uh, or NLP tasks that focus on one specific problems, such as like cohort selection, such as phenotyping or PHID identification, the majority of them is general non-specific, meaning like the majority or almost 60% of the clinical NLP tasks is not focusing on solving one particular clinical problem. Well, that's fine because like we understand that in the past two decades that people trying to like um, encourage the advancement in the clinical NLP field while not care about what could be the downstream task because they want to focus on the most fundamental task like text understanding, like text generation, right? But still we were able to identify a gap between the superpower language model in a generic language task versus what we really need in the clinical decision support systems. So this is from um, our recent paper in uh, proposing a new suite of tasks focusing on diagnostic reasoning. And also a, uh, a paper published from uh, Korean versus Poor's group on ta uh, proposing tasks that really focusing on the clinical decision support that could be run at the best side. So I want to further show that, well, our task or our, our focus, our group's focus is on the NLP task that needed for the best time decision making. And my work today, which I'm going to be presenting, it's particularly for diagnostic decision support. So um, I want to also put out like the new NLP task that published this year from the BioNLP workshop. If you know BioNLP, it's one of the largest workshop um, focusing on the bio, uh, NLP in the biomedical domain. Uh, and then one of the shared tasks this year is hosted, um, it's organized by our group. It's called the uh, problem list summarization. So the idea for problem list summarization is that we annotated a set of uh, progress notes because progress note is the, the EHR documentation that have the patient's daily progress. Um, and then we identify what is the active problems or active diagnosis given those, um, those progress notes and use that as a, um, a data set. And the problem list summarization is an NLP task that we want to train the large language models or the other models to generate this diagnosis based on 
the evidence presented in the progress notes. So this evidence is coming from the subjective sections in the progress notes, the objective sections, as well as the assessment. And the um, diagnoses are highlighted through the plan sections in the progress notes. Um, so the motivation for having this task is also uh, corresponding to what I just said earlier. When a patient's problem is getting worse, we can encounter this information overload in the EHR. And more information overload might cause more physicians burnout, which might further cause the taking decisional shortcuts and finally the diagnostic errors. So we believe that if we are able to train in large language models or the other type of models to predict this diagnosis based on tons of uh, tons of data in the progress notes, then these diagnoses would help or to, uh, they can enhance the physician's decision-making process. You can imagine if we have such models that running at the bedside, for example, in an ICU, when the physicians come in, in um, a new day, and then they can just ask like the large models to say, okay, what is the most active diagnosis from this patient given your uh, given the past 24 hours events or given the past uh, 24 hours of vital signs. So this will further help to optimize the clinician's workflow in terms of decision making. And now, uh, since I talked about this ever-changing AI, I also want to show an example. Like this is a fake example that I put into the uh, ChatGPT and asked it to generate the diagnosis. It actually generated a pretty good list of diagnoses if you read through this example. Um, and that's also one of the things that we observe from our shared task uh, organization, which is like current days, no one is no longer, uh, no one using the like classifiers or like LSTM or GNN anymore. All of them are focusing on training large language model like T5 or LAMA to solve these problems. But I want to take a step away to say that, well, we cannot really just let the large language model to predict the diagnosis and take it for granted because unknown, unknown. So I'm, side, I, I'm quoting this um, statement from uh, Donna Rumsfeld. That's about um, like there are existing these threats or like uncertainties in this large language. Well, his original statement is not about language model, but I, I quoted it to say um, that certainty inside the launch model cannot be just used for like uh, granted for the dynasty purpose. Um, and because we don't know what this large launch model knows, and we don't know how they make the decision, like their um, diagnostic making, diagnostic decision making is completely like not transparent to us. So it's really exposing a threat to the healthcare system if we just deploy these AI models or the large language models. Because like we know there are hallucination problems, we know that it's not easy to train um, a in-house language models like at the GPT scale or uh, even in a LAMA 2 scale, like a, a couple of billions of parameters. And then we also know that even though we have a LAMA models or the other types of models with weights sitting inside, our house, but then we still don't understand what happened in their weights. What does it mean if we activate attention, right? And finally, there are also legal and ethical concerns, uh, which I'm not gonna step in too much into. So our research is mainly focusing on, well, what is the approach that we can take to create this safe AI for diagnosis that take all these factors into considerations. In particular, the LM hallucinations and lack of transparency. Um, so that's my main topic that I wanna to cover today and which I'm just give you a little bit spoiler what I'm gonna talk about. So I'm gonna talk, gonna talk about the integration of knowledge graph with LLMs. And I'm also gonna talk about the prompting and graph-based prompting that allows us to inject knowledge into the LLMs. And finally, I want to talk about the first comprehensive human evaluation for safe LM diagnostic process that we developed um, to encourage future work on the safe AI diagnostic um, decision making. Um, and just a quick break. Well, going back to the main problems, we want to focus on the safe LM diagnostic process. So what does that mean? Here I highlight the main consideration that we take into uh, that, that we're focusing on. So one is the diagnostic accuracy. We wanna make sure the LM generate the accurate diagnosis. 
And secondly, it's about the explainable process. We want to make sure that, well, whatever the LLMs generated, there's a way that we can understand how they make that decision. And finally, we want to have ways to evaluate LLM diagnostic performance, not just using the automatic metrics to see, oh, here is a correct diagnosis, here is an incorrect diagnosis, but giving us a more like deeper opportunity, a deeper chance to look inside, well, what could be the missed diagnostic opportunities to, to, uh, to have further improvement. So this work is focusing on, uh, it's utilizing a retrieval argument generation framework using a knowledge graph. There are available large scale knowledge graph or knowledge source that's being underutilized for LLMs. So the National Library of Medicine's uh, UMLS, Unified Medical Language System, is one of them. If you're familiar with the um, NLM's UMLS, you know that it provides over millions of concepts and over millions of concept relations or the semantic relations between concepts. So using those concepts and relations, we're able to build this knowledge graph that's showing here, where we have the source concept and we have the target concepts. And the edges are the semantic relations between these concepts. So you can see that we have the cirrhosis as one of the source concepts. We have the uh, liver cirrhosis or gastrointestinal as its first uh, or direct neighbors because they're directly uh, connected by an edge. And then we also have abdominal pain or alcoholic or cirrhosis as target concepts. So by building this knowledge graph, we are able to perform a, what we call the multi-hop reasoning, uh, which, can, uh, which establish a connection between cirrhosis and abdominal pain or cirrhosis to alcoholic liver cirrhosis through this one hop jump. So we can reach gastrointestinal from cirrhosis and further reach the abdominal pain from the gastrointestinal. Same here, we can reach the alcoholic liver cirrhosis from cirrhosis because we have a liver cirrhosis as the intermediate step. So this multi-hop reasoning is one of the uh, NLP techniques we're gonna be using in our work. And then our work is trying to provide a solution that inject this knowledge into um, into LIMs, but utilizing a knowledge graph models. So by doing that, we're able to enhance a safer text generation. And it's also cheaper in memory and running time. That's because it's not that hard compared to pre-training a large language model. It's not hard to train a knowledge graph model from scratch. Um, there are more benefits about integrating knowledge graph with language models for diagnosis generation. So I'm just laying out here um, as a general uh, introduction. So knowledge graph is not to be like explainable or interpretable because you're able to control the multi-hop. You're able to see how one concept is concluding to the, the other concepts, what has been the intermediate steps that it, been, it went through. Um, and then it's enabling this like multi-hop reasoning. Um, and then because knowledge graph is a huge knowledge resource for all kinds of knowledge, so it also encouraged the knowledge discovery for rare disease. It doesn't rely on like the text or a certain amount of EHR that capture only a samples or a, a subcollection of the disease. It has it actually have access to all kinds of disease and their knowledge. Finally, it has this flexibility to allow heterogeneous data integration. So one thing you can imagine using the knowledge graph is well, you can identify the concept about disease or symptoms. You can also bring in more knowledge about like drugs, treatments, and even DNAs as part of the knowledge graph. So we believe that, well, not what uh, we believe, but it's it could be like a hypothesis that we're testing right now. The superpower on the text generation from the LLMs uh, plus the goal and structure knowledge representation from knowledge graph might lead to a win-win situation, which is what the, uh, our work is going to show. But it's not easy to get this like relevant knowledge from knowledge graph because especially for the UMLS, uh, uh, UMLS knowledge graph, it's like highly connected um, from concepts to concepts because there are millions of concepts, there are millions of relations. So it's really expensive. If, if you just wanna run a graph traversal algorithm on this large knowledge graph 
to pull out all the possible um, paths. So we did a quick um, sample average on like the numbers of candidate target nodes given one source node. So here's what we found. The median numbers of paths, the first half path is 368, uh, but the average numbers of paths is 2000. And then the percentage of the samples, meaning the percentage of the, um, the source targets with numbers of paths that are over a thousand is uh, 38%. So what does that mean? It means that given a high connectivity knowledge graph like UMLS, you might get exponential growth in the second half. You might get over like 400 uh, or like uh, 40,000 40, of like uh, second half path just by traversing the graph given one concept. So that is really expensive considering if we wanna convert this knowledge graph to like a embedding space or if we just want to pull out all the paths, it's not possible to read all the paths and fit those into the uh, launch models. So in our work, we focus on three uh, research questions that help to um, enable this uh, integration of knowledge graph to LLMs. Given a patient's, uh, given a note describing a patient's status and symptoms, We've tried to let the LM leverage the medical facts from a knowledge graph and generate faithful diagnosis based on these facts. So the first question we're gonna tackle is how do we retrieve relevant no medical knowledge given AKG? And secondly, we want uh, to find a way to effectively incorporate such knowledge into LLMs uh, to generate or to enhance this diagnosis generation. And ultimately we wanna design a mechanism or evaluation that would be able to address the diagnostic accuracy or diagnostic safety. So those are the three main contributions, uh, three main research questions that our work is addressing and focusing on. Um, and before we start, I just wanna show you like a, a sample progress those, uh, given that we might have some non-medical background uh, audience. Um, so the progress note has four major sections, the subjective as, the objective O assessment um, and then plan subsections. So the subjective sections is mainly written in natural language, describing the patient's like recent symptoms, past medical histories or uh, 24 hours events. And then the O is the objective data with structured data mostly about medications, laboratory results, uh, vital signs, so on and so forth. And the assessment is natural language describing the past uh, the passive and active diagnosis of problems based on a physician's judgment. And finally, the plan sections has multiple subsections where each subsection is laying out a problem, a specific problem or diagnosis and its treatment plans. So in our work, we, we take the SOA as input. Uh, some of our experiments actually leave out the O sections just because we find that uh, it's actually lower down the performance instead of bringing it up. Um, and then we use the diagnosis annotated inside the plan sections as the ground truth, um, or like the, the, especially the active diagnosis as the ground truth to evaluate LM's uh, diagnosis generation. Um, and then our methodology is laying out like this, given the input note or input description describing the patient's problems. So you can see that I highlighted some of the symptoms in the color text. So these are the symptoms that we're able to pull out the concepts in the UMLS. Um, given the UMLS knowledge graph, which is what I'm showing you is the first hop neighbor here. Like for example, we have the sepsis and then we have communicable disease or sepsis associated gastrointestinal hemorrhage. Uh, we have fever, like coughing with fever. We have coughing, like respiratory tract is associated with coughing. So you can see that by the nature of like this, uh, this first hop and also the, the representation of these concepts, there are some concepts, first hop concepts uh, or first hop neighbors, they're more relevant to this patient than the others. Like the coughing with fever, uh, given the term fever, it's more relevant to the patient's problems than the fever of the newborn because there is no information in um, the input that talks about a newborn. Uh, same as the coughing like respiratory tract, it's more relevant than post-tusive uh, post vomiting because there's nothing mentioned in the, uh, in the input that talks about the vomiting, right? So based on these like first-hand neighbors, that's more relevant to the patient's problems 
we can start doing the second hop jump to reach more um, the, uh, concepts. So here I just highlighted the ones that's mostly um, relevant to the input because like this could be the potential diagnosis or the potential explanations for the diagnosis given these patient's problems. So we're not doing like a um, traversal that based on all the path, like we are doing the traversal based on each hop and find the top uh, most relevant end, uh, end concepts and start doing the second hop traversal given those hops. So we named this process, uh, we actually designed a neural, uh, graph neural network that, that, that performed this process. We call it diagnostic reasoning knowledge graph. Um, and basically this knowledge graph models would do is to retrieve the top end relevant knowledge paths because at the end, we are not just giving all of the paths, we're just giving the top end based on each hop's decision. So now I wanna get into a little bit further of the technical details, what this Dr. Knows architecture uh, or Dana's reasoning knowledge graph model look like. So this figure is read from left to right Given the patient's input, of course, like this could be a note, this could be a sentence, and we highlight the concepts that we can identify easily through uh, some, sort of, some sort of concept extraction tool, for example, like CTEX, click me on my ass, I'm sure some of you are familiar with. And based on this input, we can first get an input representation or the input embeddings using a pre-trained uh, bird-based models. So here we're using separate because it's pre-trained on UMLS biomedical entity linking task. Uh, so it has higher quality in terms of the medical concept representation. And then this uh, concepts, we convert them into CUIs or the concept unit identifiers. You can see they are not this, they are a string of numbers uh, uh, instead of the concept itself. So this allows us to take into different variations, lexicon variations of the concepts into account. So the concepts showing up in the input would be the starting queries to do the traversal. Once we get the subgraphs, like the um, example we showed earlier, and then we can fit that subgraphs into these graph model components that first identify these like um, representations of the first hop neighbors using a graph neural network that assign the semantic meanings to these different concepts. So the graph neural the idea for graph neural network is that we not only want the concept representation by themselves, like by coughing sepsis, we also want their representation dependent on what is the neighbors that they're associating with. And once we have that, for each of the paths, we're able to generate a path embedding. So this is why we have like six paths shown here. Therefore, we have six embeddings shown here. I have the detailed representation for the path encoder. If we have more time, I can go back to that. But the path will finally represent it as embeddings and fit into a path ranker, which is also a neural network, um, which I'm going to show you in the next slides. And then based on this path ranker, the path, the idea for path ranker is it start to rank the path based on how relevant that path representation dependent on the, um, the input or relevant to the input representation in terms of logical meaning or uh, logical or semantic meanings. So once we finalize the path ranker uh, attached or like assign the scores to different paths, we're able to pull out the top N. Here we can be top six or top eight, uh, depending on what's the average numbers of diagnosis in your data set. Um, and pull out, for example, here we pull out the top three uh, concepts. So these concepts is the first hop neighbors that we're going to start performing the next hop on. So these three concepts will become the new starting CUI for the next round and going through the same process again. So you can also see that the path ranker, uh, besides the path embeddings as input, it also takes the input text encoding or input text embeddings as input, as well as the input concept embeddings. So, so this is because we want the path ranker uh, or the ranking procedure is dependent on not only the input text description, but also the concept representation as a um, context. So here I'm showing you the uh, more technical details on this diagnostic reasoning path ranking. The idea is, well, to, we want to ask to what extent does the current knowledge or the current path align with the patient's condition presented in the input? So we have the input text hidden states, we have the input con concept list hidden states, and the candidate path embedding. So we designed two mechanisms, two attention mechanisms 
to, uh, to produce these uh, ranking scores. One is the multi-head attention that captures three interactions between the input uh, concept or input text embeddings versus the current candidate path embeddings. So these are neutral, meaning that the current uh, candidate path is neutral relation to the input text. It could be contradiction, meaning that if the current path, for example, like fevers with the newborn, is not necessarily or is contradict to the fact presented in uh, the input representation. Finally, we have the entailment, meaning that they further elaborate more knowledge given the, uh, the input text representation. So finally, we concatenate these three representation um, and it fit in, into a multi-attention layers uh, and then get the scores. There is a second embedding, uh, or there is a second attention mechanism we designed to capture these uh, interactions between the candidate path embeddings versus uh, the input representation. So we just name it as trilinear attention without imposing any kinds of like matrix uh, operations here. And then we are comparing the multi-head attention with trilinear attention. So taking a step back uh, to give you a more high, high level uh, overview of this approach. So we are trying to come up with two different approach to modeling what is the relationship between the current candidate path embedding versus the given representation. One is in, in, imposing like a logical relations. The other is just to let the network learn that relations along its uh, model learning. So to be able to achieve the goal of training a graph neural network to learn that relations, we designed two loss mechanisms. So one is the binary cost entropy loss that to predict the, uh, the target concepts. So we are not predicting the path. We're focusing on what is the ultimate target concepts that path can lead us to and then measure the uh, cross entropy loss on that. And the second is called the conjecture learning loss on discriminative representation learning on the path. So here, what we are showing is the contrast learning loss where we have the positive samples, the, where the positive samples mean starting from the concepts of the source concepts, we're gonna end to the correct target concepts through that path. So these are the positive path or positive samples. While the negative samples are given the same source concepts, given maybe the same uh, intermediate concepts, we might end up with different uh, or the wrong target concepts. This would be called as the negative concepts. So I'm gonna provide more details uh, in the backup slides if we have more time. Um, and I'll, I could also show you what is the training process look like for our graph neural network. But using these two laws together, we're able to train that uh, Dr. Nose models, these graph neural network models to be able to pr uh, predict the correct path to select. And then how do we inject or how do we incorporate this graph neural network into the large language model? So we're doing it under the uh, retrieval augment generation framework. So the first step is once we have a uh, graph model, the Dr. Nose model pre-trained, that would be able to generate or pull out this different path to given an input patient's progress note. We start to incorporate this path using this like prompt template. So our prompt engineering work include that we have a samples uh, or set of manually drafted prompts from subject uh, experts and non-subject experts. And we, we have some modules for quality estimations to select the best prompt template. And then our final prompt template would incorporate not only the prompt template, but also the knowledge graph path with a few future examples showing how, like the, um, how, one, uh, how the diagnosis can be concluded from the knowledge path as well as the input progress notes. So once we have this like best prompt template, we're able to fit in the knowledge graph path as well as the input progress notes um, to the in-context learning LLMs. So here we're using the ChatGPT. We have other um, results from like fine tuning LLMs, um, but that's not, if we have time, we can get to that. Um, so the prompting the LLMs will be able to predict the diagnosis as well as explain its reasoning. And the last step is for us to have a, a group of physicians evaluating this output based on the input node with or without this knowledge path, which I'm gonna show you the results on. So first I wanna show you the results on our um, Dr. Knows models using the automatic metrics evaluations. So here we're using two types of metrics. 
One is called Rouge. So Rouge is a um, automated metric that widely used in NLP area that's focusing on n-grams overlap. Like there are different variants. It, it could be on the bigram overlaps. It could be on the longest subsequence uh, overlapping. So there are different ways to do that n-grams. Um, and then the second type of metric is called the Cooley F-score. So Cooley F-score is based on once we compute or once we convert like the diagnosis back to the concept you need identifiers, then we're able to measure what is the degree of overlapping between the predicted uh, concepts versus the ground truth concepts. And finally, that's what the F-score represent here. So on the Cooley F-scores as well as the root scores, we can see that um, we, we are showing two sets of results. One is on the prompt-based zero shot on the chat GPT with or without path. The other is the few shot learning for the chat GPT on three, uh, three shot or five shot. We can't go beyond five shot is because like um, because of the, the context limit. So we're using chat GPT 3.5 by the time we finish this experiment. You can see that the ones that, uh, the numbers that highlighted in bound found text are in, in the color text are the ones where it has significant uh, improvements, statistical significant improvement over the baseline methods. So compared to the without path situation on zero shot, um, the, with the path, it definitely improves um, the confidence improval a lot and as well as the um, QE F scores on the QE F scores. Um, and then on the few shot settings, we can see that the five shot plus path is the ones that perform the best compared to the five, th uh, five shot without the path. It actually like the significant, um, the significance of the improvement is actually quite obvious here. Uh, same, the same patterns we observe on the root scores, which is based on the n-grams overlap. So the main takeaway from this figure is that, well, on the automated evaluation metrics, we do observe a significant improvements using this uh, knowledge graphs predicted, predicted by our um, graph neural network. And now I want to move on to the human evaluation um, because that's where most of the like, interesting findings are. So it's a lot of information here, but I, I do want to like walk you through a little bit um, to show how this survey is being designed. A LLMs, the ChatGPT's output has two components. One is the diagnosis, the other is the reasoning sections. So the diagnosis is highlighted in red fonts and the reasoning section is in the blue font. Um, on, we have two types of scoring. One is on the diagnosis and the other is on the reasoning. So on the diagnosis, we first evaluate each diagnosis that's separated by this semicolon. Um, and then in terms of what is the, the uh, what's the accuracy, and what's their omission, whether that diagnosis is being, uh, sorry. Uh, first, we evaluate it on the entire diagnosis output in terms of whether there is a diagnosis being omitted or whether it's because of uh, what, what types of uncertainty that lead to that omission. And secondly, we, we extract each diagnosis and score uh, that diagnosis based on the accuracy, the plausibility, specificity and also whether then the diagnosis is an abstractive diagnosis, meaning it's not shown in the progress node at all. Uh, and it's, purely, it's purely by the uh, physician's abstraction to conclude that diagnosis. Uh, you can see that um, the, the right-hand side has the, all the detailed questions we ask for each of this, um, for each of this category. For example, like the, for the plausibility, if the diagnosis is accurate, whether the diagnosis is possible at all, or whether it's uh, at the right specificity level, uh, for example, if it's um, if it's pneumonia, then whether it's whether it has the right details to say what is the cause for the pneumonia, um, so on and so forth. Um, and then on the reasoning scoring, we are first evaluate the entire reasoning scoring uh, to see whether there is any omission in the reasoning or whether the reasoning contain any abstraction, meaning like the ChatGPT or LLMs is pure, like abstracting their knowledge using their internal knowledge to conclude that diagnosis, not based on uh, the progress notes. Oh, sorry, uh, not, yeah, not providing uh, based on the input that's missing in the progress notes or whether that abstraction is an effective abstraction, meaning that the uh, abstraction is really correct, can lead to correct reasoning. 
Um, and then for each of the sentence in our reasoning section, we're able to evaluate whether that reasoning is comprehension, meaning does the sentence contain any evidence of incorrect reading comprehension, or it's a recall, meaning the sentence contain any incorrect recall of knowledge or rationale, does the, does the uh, reasoning contain any incorrect reasoning steps? So these are the main human evaluation um, aspects that we focus on in this survey. I also want to add that our human evaluation actually borrowed from two major efforts um, that we that we have uh, collected. So one is called is like Super DX instruments. So it's a survey instrument that focusing on capturing the missed diagnostic opportunities, um, and then it's also recommended by the society to improve diagnosis in medicine as a clinical recommendation, as a guidance for the clinical practices to to review the misdiagnostic opportunities um, in the daily, uh, daily care. And then the second reference is that we did a really thorough literature review on the existing LLMs clinical text generation evaluation um, and find out what is the common aspects that people are evaluating now on um, and pull out all these aspects together and then put into our human evaluation framework. So this literature review is still um, we are still writing into a paper, so um, please look forward to that. Um, and I want to show you just one quick highlight on the human evaluation in general. So we find that both methods, like with or without the knowledge graph um, for ChatGPT field shot learning, the diagnostic accuracy judged by the uh, human evaluators is actually above 66%. So here I also want to emphasize one more thing, like the human evaluators are a group of uh, four medical professionals. Two of them are senior physicians uh, with board certificate, uh, certifications. One of them is med medical residents and the other one is uh, medical students who are about to graduate. Um, and then, so these four, um, res uh, these four medical professionals have inter annotator agreements above 80% using this human evaluation framework. Um, and then the subcategories where the knowledge graph, well, incorporating the knowledge graph has the most impact on, meaning they have this, they secure significant uh, powers on, is on the level of abstraction, both on the diagnosis and the reasoning, and also the percentage of the correct reasoning. So you can see that with knowledge graph input, the levels of abstractiveness bring up to 87%. And then the levels of uh, correct reasoning bring up to 55%. Uh, um, which is shown by statistical significance. And then here I'm showing you an example where like in our human evaluation, we find the predicted diagnosis without knowledge path lead to impossible diagnosis. While given the knowledge path, it become possible. So you can see that in the input progress note is just part of it because this is from Mimic. We cannot show the um, full text here. And then this is the Dr. Knows which is top six knowledge path. <clears throat> with the like these little symbols representing it's like it's, there is a self loop pointing back to that concepts on the second half. Um, and then the ground truth diagnosis is showing here, and then we have the predicted diagnosis um, without the knowledge path showing is influenza A, sepsis, pneumothorax. Um, while with the knowledge path, it becomes possible in this case. Um, yeah. And then this figure is showing on the reasoning sections without the knowledge path, like the human evaluation thing, it's not a correct reasoning. And then with the knowledge path as uh, input, we can see that especially highlighted in this green font, this is where the ChatGPT start to say how they utilize this given knowledge path and conclude that diagnosis. So by human judgment, um, the physicians think that they are more uh, correct or they're more uh, grounded in the knowledge than the ones without the knowledge path. And then finally, I want to include one error analysis example to show uh, what could be the future improvements on these methods. So one is, you can see that I highlighted this allergies, not non, no non-drug allergies in the input. While the doctor knows the graph neural networks retrieve still the drug allergy as one of the paths, 
Um, so this is where like, I think currently like the concept extraction tool need to be further improved or we need to incorporate more like negations to identify what are the concepts that should be considered as the starting concepts to perform the graph traversal. There's also a situation where like while the knowledge graph have a correct path, which is showing in this like green path, the ChatGPT failed to pick up that path, failed to utilize that path. So you can see that the ChatGPT doesn't incorporate that cirrhosis of liver in its output at all, um, while the cirrhosis of liver is actually the, in the ground choose uh, diagnosis. So in other words, we find that there are two types of errors that can be further improved. One is on the graph model side. We definitely need to improve the accuracy for the graph models to incorporate more accurate knowledge path. The second is on whether there's more effective ways to incorporate, uh, to let the LLMs uh, incorporate this knowledge path more efficiently. So finally, I want to conclude my talk uh, with a few discussion points that I hope to cover. One is definitely on the improvements for safer LLM for diagnostic process. We definitely need more controllability and explainability. So what I'm just what I just presenting is just one way for, to approach the safer AI for diagnostic accuracies. We definitely need other ways. For example, we have the, uh, besides the knowledge graph, we have like literatures, like in the PubMed, maybe with using like REG, uh, regional augmented generation on the literatures, we can still achieve the same effect as knowledge graph. And then we also need to pave the way for explainable AI decision support. We all not only need the diagnosis as the final outcome from the LMS, we also need the uh, LLMs to be able to say and reliably why they think the diagnosis is, is such and such. And finally, I definitely think that multiple model LLM for healthcare is one major uh, work that we should be pr uh, pursuing. And then physician center evaluation is definitely what we should be um, encouraging. That's why we propose this like human evaluation for the work. So I want to give a round of uh, applause to all of my co-authors and also thank uh, NIH uh, for supporting my research. And now I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. I can just see from the representation of the people we have attending, we have bioinformatics, clinical informatics, data science, um, and uh, AI, ML, and even even, uh, even last but not least to colleagues over at the operations side. Um, I have a couple questions and also everybody feel free to enter your questions in the chat or um, you can unmute yourself too. Um, I have a question back way back in your slide where you um, showed different applications of, of clinical NLP and you had that large um, category of kind of unspecified things that were not a specific, um, specific thing like diagnosis or treatment and risk factors and things like that. Um, can, is there, can you provide some more detail about what are some of the things in there? Is that just, oh, it's just, oh, yes, that slide, that regular clinical care or it wasn't specified or, you know, maybe it was research or something. Can you say something about that? Yeah, definitely. That's a good question. So under this category, there definitely, well, first of all, we, we make this figure when we did our scoping reviews, we specifically look at whether that task is addressing like a clinical application or a clinical issue that um, really exist. So under that category of general non-specific, there are tasks that's really fundamental NLP tasks. Um, and I think the main motivation of having that is just people think that, well, there's a task exists in general domain NLP, so we need the task in the clinical domain. So those tasks include like uh, natural language inference or clinical natural language inference, uh, entity linking, by, like biomedical entity linking, meaning the concept normalization, um, and or like the uh, semantic uh, semantic similarity, like given a two two sentences um, in the clinical text, whether they're similar or no. So those categories capture, um, I would say, majority of the tasks falling under that categories is is like that. Okay, great. Um, and my other question is a broader question, which is um, the things that you're describing are things that everybody wants right now, you know, reduce the EHR burden, burnout, all those things. And um, 
you know, where are you on the cycle of, of implementing these things? And if, if you're far along, then, you know, what are some, some of the things that have helped? And if you're, if that's, if that's still a goal, what are some, what are the next things to do and, and how to, um, how to improve that chances of that being successful? Yeah, that's also a really great question. So I would say that I'm still really far, our work is still really far from that route. So we are definitely trying out different different angles of solving that problem. One of them, which we think is the diagnostic decision support. But before we can get to the point that we have a system that's able to provide a diagnosis, we need to first make sure it's safe. And before we need to make sure it's safe, we need to have a evaluation that focusing on the safety. So that's where I am right now. That's where our work is, is right at now, meaning that we are just establishing the ground or like the basic um, tools for like more advanced research or uh, deeper research on how do we actually improve or optimize the clinical workflow for the physicians. But particularly in, in terms of the diagnostic reasoning or diagnostic decision making. Yeah, and I, I did, uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, and um... But I want to stress how important this work is. And I do know a lot of people are using either apps that they built themselves or something that someone else had built, like based on chat GPT or other things like that. And I guess that, you know, that's someone doing something on their own, looking up a resource, kind of like, you know, a medical looking up the literature or, or textbook or asking a colleague kind of thing. But, you know, obviously you want to have more rigid evaluation validation before something formal that becomes part of the medical record and, you know, that would be like more like a medical, uh, like a medical product that, um, and part of the EHR. So yeah, thanks for that. And I do see a question from uh, a couple of questions um, from one from John Osborne. Where did the labels come from for Dr. Nose? Are they extracted from the soap note using some other tool or manually created? Yeah. So uh, let me go back to the, the, I have one slice of, yeah. So, um, we have a set of annotations. We, we actually develop our own annotation guidelines uh, that's uh, described in one of our paper in our uh, 2022, where like, we annotate the progress notes. Uh, and then in particular, in the plan subsections, we annotate the diagnosis, the active problems, um, and then the treatment plans. So the input to Dr. Knows is the SOA, and then the ground truth is the diagnosis or like the concepts about diagnosis in showing up in the plans of sections that we annotate. Um, and I hope that answered your question, John. Yes, it did. Thank you, Yanji. And that was, uh, that was really good. And one other quick question. Why did you use the Rouge 2 and uh, Rouge L evaluations? Is it just because they're so fast? Like, why didn't you, you know, use like a blue or maybe Comet or something else? Yeah, so Rouge is mainly for summarization, while Blur is for um, translation. The main difference between summarization and translation is that for translation, you're going to penalize, like Blur would penalize the length of the, um, of the prediction being too far from the given original source text, while Rouge focuses on summarization doesn't have that pen penalization. So in other words, like Rouge is designed to evaluate on, on like much shorter text compared to the source text. So that's why we go with Rouge. And plus like this task we formulated as a summarization because like it, it's definitely doing like extractive summarization on some of the concepts or diagnosis and abstractive summarization on the other types of diagnosis. Um, so that's why we use Rouge. Thanks. Yeah, but uh, definitely Rouge Yeah, go ahead. Uh, there's also a question from Jeff. <clears throat> I'll, I'll let him ask that if you want to unmute yourself. Just a question about the next generation of NL of LLMs. Yep, thanks. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thanks, Amy. Um, and wonderful presentation. And doing this was wonderful. Very exciting. Um, I guess I wanted to sort of kick off your discussion questions because to me, the big question around how we get to the next LLM is in healthcare is an open one and a difficult one, quite frankly, for me to see whether that's going to come from a commercial vendor like an Epic or more of an academic medical center generated collaborative effort. And I just was curious about sort of how you see that evolving in the next phase and what, if any, considerations do you see coming down for that, for the adoption of that? 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. That's that's a really great question. But um, and I might I might need to like. I mean, I have a lot to say to that, to be honest. But uh, I think I'm trying to summarize my my response uh, using a couple of sentences. So the short answer, I think, would be mostly from the um the the companies like Meta, like you know, who develop llamas. But um, I think different institutions might have their own versions of fine tuning um, or fine tuned language models that train on their own data sets. Just because current days like, like the um, parameter efficient fine tuning, I don't know if you're familiar with that, it's, it's really efficient. Um, but I do know that I'm sure most of you are also aware that like the universities, uh, some of the universities have access to like farms of GPUs, like they have their own internal, like um, superpower language models, like Gatatron, Megatron, that is in University of Florida. Right. Um, I I don't that I don't believe that we'll be able to share that just because they train on their own, like your uh, Florida's like private EHR data set. I don't think they would conquer that um, legal concern to share that. But they might have a version that's like using B identified EHR and they might be able to share that. So, but I still think because of this sheer interest in the community to get to a point just to start fine tuning the uh, superpower language models and for different purpose, I think that would be the main trend for this field for the next generation LMS. Yeah. Thanks. I think because I mean, one of the advantages that I see in the work you do is the transparency and the explainability of that. And that's where a lot of the commercial vendors are uncomfortable, shall we say. Um, and, and you know, quite frankly, medicine uh, oftentimes does not adopt commercial solutions unless it's already been vetted by their colleagues, right? I mean, you don't want to go out on a limb too far on your own on that in that way. But anyway, thanks for your thoughts. I appreciate that. Thank you. Other comments or questions? We have three minutes. Yeah, Jim Smino, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, quick question about the, uh, hi, that was a great talk. I really, uh, really enjoyed that. And I, 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 my ears perked up, especially when you talked about using UMLS semantic relationships from the Metathesaurus. Um, and so, and because we're out of time, I won't give too much background, but Suffice it to say that they're un, they're they're sort of uncurated. They just come from whatever the source terminologies put in there, and the relationships are kind of poorly defined. There's broader, narrower, parent-child, uh, related, like, whatever that means, and other. And then other, they add some semantics to that that come from the UMLS semantic network. So uh, I don't remember what they are offhand, but things like a a, a disease, a, an organism causes a disease, things like that. So I'm wondering if you if if you found um, these things useful, how useful they were, whether you used the semant the actual semantic relations, um, because the the information is kind of junky. Like if you try to use it as a hierarchy, for instance, the broader, narrower parent child, you can end up with cycles uh, because yeah. of the way the mappings are done. So uh, could you comment on the use of those a little more and whether they cause trouble? Yeah, definitely. We definitely got got some troubles from using it. Um, and I definitely, I 100% agree that like they are, like they could be really chunky and they could be garbage in, in that sense. So what we did is we have a subject expert, um, which is Mike Murchie Offshore. Um, we looked at these like semantic relations, each one of them, when we look at a few examples for each one of them and picked out the ones that's specifically for diagnostic purpose, like meaning if this relations, it's about, maybe I can show you in the um, example output that some of the relations that we focus on, for example, a pathological process of, or like the possibly equivalent to, they're also like causative agent of, or like has the temporal relationship of. These relations, if they have the strong semantics and could be indicating the diagnostic process of, a, um, of how the disease happened or pathological process, then we include that in our knowledge graph. Yep. So in other words, the, pr the pre-work that we did before building the graph is definitely a lot. We're actually writing a paper with uh, NLM right now regarding how should be, what should be the recommended usage of UMLS. Great, thank you. 
I see another question here. Um, thanks for the great talk. I'm interested in technical details of the training process. Could you elaborate more on slide 29, um, training code implementation and path extractions from KG shareable at this point? Thanks again. Yeah, so um, I don't think I have enough time to go through that details, but um, I do want to say that the, like our paper is on MacHive right now, um, where like we describe like the what the training process look like, how do we build the training data. So feel free to um, to read that. Uh, let me pull out that. Yeah, so this is the 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 title of our paper on MacHive right now. All right, unfortunately, we're out of time. <clears throat> and um, also, this is the last uh, power talk of the fall semester, given that <clears throat> winter break is starting at UAB. And um, so we don't have a talk for a while, not until next year. And um, in the meantime, I wish everybody a safe and happy holiday season. And we'll see you next year. And thank you very much to Dr. Gao for the great presentation. Thank you all for attending for this talk and for all of our all of our successful our power talks. We really appreciate everybody's participation and discussion. All right. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.